when we first encounter somebody, our brain, our brains go into a kind of chemical override that has to do with dopamine and adrenaline. And that's that nice, juicy feeling of falling in love. Absolutely. And we all, and we all love that. Blind and stupid, right? And as we're <laughs> falling in love, we might tell our friend, oh, I'm sure I love him because he has a nice, secure attachment style. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Right? Of course you but Maybe that's not the whole story. Welcome back to another edition here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia Falco Bekali, your host. And today we're going to talk about something that touches everybody relationships, amorous relationships, whether between a man and a woman or the same sex, it doesn't really matter. Um, we have seen COVID and especially the lockdown has brought, let's say, some interesting dynamics to some of the relationships out there. Some got closer, a lot of them split up. So you just sometimes wonder what makes a good relationship, what breaks a good relationship, and what are the potential tools in order to get something perhaps back on track that wasn't on track for a while. And this is why I did invite Catherine Ford, Dr. Catherine Ford, to the show. She has been a um, therapist, couple therapist for the last 20 years. She earned her MD at Brown Ivy League University in the US and continued also studying at Stanford University. And she developed a very interesting concept she's going to present to us when we talk about relationships and how to make them successful. Catherine, thank you so much for being with us here on Mentory TV. Patricia, thanks so much for that great introduction. It's great to be with you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, Catherine, I am so excited to have you on the show simply because, like I think a lot of people, <clears throat> they always wonder what makes a relationship, what breaks a relationship? Is it my fault? Is it their fault when things go wrong? Was it me in the first place, perhaps picking the wrong partner? Um, was I honest with myself? Are they honest with me, integrity, etc.? So there's many concepts we're going to touch on during our conversation. But you have developed, and let us start with that, really, the aperture awareness, um, let's say, system or approach to relationships. And before getting into the more, let's say, general picture of, of relationships, let's talk about what aperture awareness is. So our conversation falls in the concept that you actually developed. Sure. Um, let's talk about that. You know, I think I have always been interested in relationships and in particular couples relationships. I think a lot of us come out of childhood with some burning question to solve. And mine was, um, like most people, the major couples relationship I was watching continuously was my parents' relationship. And what I saw were two things. And I think two things I carried away from that experience. One was that it really mattered. I could see the intensity in their efforts to connect and their desire to be together in their needing to be understood by each other. The second thing was I could see how difficult it was. It wasn't easy. I saw the, the many times that they came away from encounters with each other, frustrated, sad, angry, not feeling understood, feeling misunderstood. And so I came out of that experience thinking, this is really important and it's really hard. And that was kind of my problem to solve in terms of life. I, I really felt like that's the big thing to figure out. I took a degree in psychology as an undergraduate, which was kind of along that line, those lines. And even though I went to medical school, my main goal, I think, was always to end up working with relationships. And... Um, And the other thing that happened, so I took psychiatry training at Stanford, but Stanford is, is in California. And when I landed in California, of course, I landed also in the lap of meditation and yoga. And those two art forms and studies are all about paying attention in the moment. So when I started working with people, I, did two, I made two pivots. One pivot was at first I was working like most people with individuals. 
a little bit of couples, mostly individuals. But what I saw was confirming what I came out of childhood with, which was relationships really mattered. By and large, the people that would come and talk to me, what they were wanting help with and concerned about and upset about was how their major relationships were going. So I sort of decided pretty quickly, this will be much more effective if, if I actually meet with both people, not one person. So I quickly started to increasingly meet with couples and with other relationships in instead of just with individuals. The other pivot was pivoting more and more towards paying attention to what was happening in the room in the moment. Like most people trained as therapists, I came away with a lot of models in my head, a lot of ideas. And I think even um, lay people these days have a lot of psychological ideas, which which can be helpful, but it's a little bit like reading the roadmap. You wanna pull over to the side of the road and look at the map now and then, but when you're driving, meaning when you're actually interacting, you really need to pay attention to what's actually happening, you know, eyes on the road kind of thing. So that brings us to Aperture. Eyes on the road increasingly for me had to do with Aperture. Aperture is like the Aperture in your camera, the model for which is, the, is our iris. Aperture is something that opens and closes dynamic to allow contact with something. In this case, when I'm talking about it, contact between two people. And it's a very much in the moment phenomenon. It's not something, it's something that you sense in real time, it changes constantly. It's not, it's not something static like, oh, Catherine's very open or Patricia's very open. It's something that changes as we go along. Um, if I say something that perplexes you, you might have a little moment of closure, like, wait a second, I have to figure that out. Um, if I say something that pleases you, your aperture tends to open at that moment. So we need to remember that this is something that's constantly changing. The other important thing about Aperture is that it concerns the most important thing to pay attention to. I often call Aperture the North Star. And what that means is relationships are very, very complicated. When you were introducing me, you, you mentioned about 10 different things that have to do with relationships, and they're all true and they're all important. And part of what happens is as we're in conversation with each other and trying to make these connections that are so important, Everything depends on our openness to each other. If you think about it, I could be very articulate and speaking very sincerely, but if I'm closed or you're closed, I'm not going to be understood. I'm not going to be cared about. It's going to, it's going to bomb, basically. Yeah. And so we, what we all know, if we really think about it, is when you're in contact with somebody else, the question that's hovering in your mind is, how can I get you to be open to me? And, and that's openness. Exactly. And that openness, I think, is the most important question uh, in this conversation, because this is where everything starts and ends. And I wonder about openness. Is it a, a question of nature or nurture? Uh -huh. it's always, it's, that's always the question, isn't it? Um, you know, I think long ago we realized both experientially and in our science, it's always both. Right. So, yes, um, some of us are a little bit more comfortable socially, which is openness than other people. Other people can be a little bit more shy. In fact, shyness is one of the things that was discovered to be kind of a genetic trait. So shyness has to do with how instantly open you are or not. And then there's all the nurture. There's all the experience we had in childhood. There's experiences we had with each other going back to the beginning of the relationship. And then there's the experience in the moment. And so what I like to point people to is, yes, you might naturally be a little shy or not. You might have had a bad experience in a previous relationship, which tends to make you close more easily in certain circumstances. Nevertheless, there's always the opportunity in the moment for me to help you to be more open and for you to help me to be more open and for you to pay attention to your openness and I mine. And so more and more, I emphasize the real, the real show is what's happening right here and right now. And we're not, we're not, um, how can I say it? It's not all about nature or nurture, thank goodness, because in each moment, we're trying to make the relationship just a little bit better. And we do have that opportunity. Yeah, and I think the mindset comes to it. Uh, I yeah. think because you know, openness, you can say, Hey, I'm open. On the right. other hand, the more open you are, the more vulnerable you are. And yes. I think there the entire question is what impacts our aptness for aperture? Uh, 
Um, yeah. you know, okay, maybe I'm a bit more extrovert than let's say my daughter. She's a bit more right. quiet, less of a, you know, a extrovert. Right. So for me to give personal data <clears throat> away is easier um, because I think, yeah, perhaps I'm more vulnerable, but why would I not talk about it? We are all kind of the same. It can happen to right. everybody. And I think this kind of aperture or openness and the question of vulnerability, how you see that, isn't that also a question of the culture you come from? And I'm not only talking about the culture as in the country, but I talk about the family culture, the trauma mm -hmm. you, you just mentioned, uh, childhood, but also relationship traumas. So that surely must impact your ability to have that aperture awareness. Yes, yes and. Okay. Um, I like that you brought up vulnerability. Sometimes I think the big riddle that we're constantly trying to solve for in life is how can I get the most contact with you, the most contact with other people in my life um, that feels good, that nurtures me, that helps me be well and healthy with the least possible injury. And we're constantly, we are consciously trying to solve for that sometimes, but even when we're unconscious about it, our nervous system is constantly trying to solve for that problem. Our limbic systems, which are the part of our brain that are constantly reading other people's feelings and intentions, are constantly trying to solve for what's possible here. Am I gonna get loving contact or am I gonna be injured? And if we sense that we're gonna be injured, that's what, that's what closes us down. That's when the aperture closes. If we sense that, hey, there's a pretty good chance here that I'm going to feel something yummy, then our aperture opens up. The thing about our past is we're, I think a little bit, we've, we've become very psychological and we have learned a lot about how influenced we are by our families, our cultures, our previous trauma, et cetera. But we're not prisoners of those things. The kinds of things that we're trying to, to learn about throughout our lives or, or like how to be close to each other, how to be patient with each other, how to understand each other. These are lifetime learning projects. And so, yes, you may have come out of previous relationships, either in childhood or because you grew up in a culture that, that tended to be very cautious, as some do, or a family that tended to be very cautious. You may come out of that a little bit, say, behind the game in terms of how to be open. And yet it's the same problem that we're all solving for our whole lives, which is how to be open in a way that's safe, in a way that nurtures, nurtures us and nurtures the other person. So I really do emphasize that there are certain things that we can't expect that the set we came to the stage with from our families or whatever is all we've got. That's kind of what we're starting with. And then it has to do with our mindfully kind of building towards better and better skills. Absolutely. And that brings the entire awareness into the game. So, yes. um, and there I was thinking, okay, aperture awareness on one hand, so I might have that and I am an open and honest person and I approach my uh, relationship or the potential relationship um, that way. But the other side doesn't know anything about aperture, about awareness. Yes. Um, yes. You know, how do I, yes. you know, with this kind of attitude, how do I start with the picking the right guy? Because then I was thinking about uh -huh. you know, the attachments Attachment styles, so right. which, which are four, and you know, I would love you to expand on them a little bit and put those also in in connection with aperture awareness and how that really interacts positively, but pot potentially uh, also negatively. Yes, um, let me think about what I want to do with that because I actually don't teach aperture. Um, I don't teach attachment styles. So I can hear that you want me to say something about. Yeah, well, that. you know, I don't. I don't necessarily want you to say something. But I was, I was thinking. Okay, so attachment styles is, you know, you have the secure one. Yes. yes. The anxious one. You have the avoidant one, yes. and then you have the fearful um, avoidant one. So the first two, like secure, right. and anxious, are pretty much still secure. They are open to intimacy. Right. They expect right. positive stuff. And then maybe the avoidant with the avoidant one yeah. is kind of like, yes, no, but they have kind of problems. So let me tell you, let me, let me, let me explain why I don't, why I don't talk about it. 
It's not that I don't think it's important. Attachment styles are very important. Attachment styles belong on that map that I'm talking about that you need to pull over to the side of the road and read. I don't actually think we pick our partners by examining their attachment styles. Um, and I don't necessarily think that we should. I think that I was just about to say, but maybe we should, but maybe we should. Um, you know, I just don't think that we work that logically and mentally. You know, there's a lot out in the world that tells us that many things that we can analyze logically and mentally, everything from how we uh, choose our investments to how we choose our partners, there's the logical mental part of it. And then there's what we actually do. And what we actually do is there's so much going on when we encounter another person. The idea that we would be able to analyze all of that and come away with a spreadsheet that tells us, yes, this is the person or no, it isn't, is not actually what's going on. I mean, how many times have you had a friend that comes to you and she tells you about this new person she met? And she says, you know, I like these things, but I'm concerned about these things. And, and for some reason, the things she's concerned about really have you concerned. And you say, oh, I don't know. I don't think you should go out with them again. You know, is is she not going to go out with him again? If she really feels compelled toward this person, she's going out, going to go out with him again. What I think is that our brains can well process, and I don't mean um, um, making mistakes. I mean they we well process a whole set of variables that include things that we pick up about attachment style and that are like attachment style, but go way beyond that. One of one of the people that I love their work talks about um, the, that the limbic system is processing a fire hydrant size amount of data as yeah. compared to most things arrive in a little trickle of a stream. In other words, it's the most powerful part of our brain. It's processing and analyzing intelligently way more information than we'll ever know about. And that was, that's what goes into open and closed. When we first encounter somebody, our, brain, our brains go into a kind of chemical override that has to do with dopamine and adrenaline. And that's that nice, juicy feeling of falling in love. Absolutely. And we all, and we all love that. Blind and stupid, right? And as we're falling in love, we might tell our friend, oh, I'm sure I love him because he has a nice, secure attachment style. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Right? Of course you but Maybe that's not the whole story. So I think the real story here, you know, there was a third thing that I came away from childhood and even now with about relationships that I actually think isn't true. The story that we get from media, TV, movies, et cetera, about couples is that it's all about finding the right person. Yeah. If you think about a great love story, it, it's full of these moments where there's near misses, they go apart, they come back together, there's difficulty. Finally, they ride it off into the sunset happily ever after, right? And what that teaches us or tries to tell us is it's all about finding the right person. And I don't think that's true. I think that it's about finding the right enough person and that our brains kind of choose that person based on a whole lot of things that we're partly aware of and partly unaware of. But really the quality of the relationship is about what happens next. Relationships are not something that we come into because we put a ring on our finger, walk down the aisle, uh, you know, hire the right caterer. Relationships are something that we start with another person and then we learn together how to do the relationship. And the important element there is learning. I often tell people, have a really grand vision for your relationship. Don't have one of those little measly visions that says, oh, well, I guess this is good enough, or maybe I shouldn't expect too much nonsense. You should expect everything. You should expect the moon, especially in your important relationships. As long as you remember that that vision of what you want is what you're learning to do, not what you're already supposed to do or what the other person is supposed to know how to do. You're supposed to help each other learn. Now, I think that is fantastic because, first of all, there are a few words that struck me. You're not looking for the right one. Yes. You're looking for the right enough one. Right exactly. enough one. Exactly. And, some, and somebody that inspires you. You know, this project of being a couple is really hard. You can't do it because of practical considerations. You need that, that little oomph of inspiration. Yeah. So the dopamine is also the motivational hormone. So yes. we get the dopamine kick when we meet somebody, chemistry is happening. Yes. And it's just enough to make us perhaps 
ask for another date or agree yes. to another date. Yes. And then the vision. I like that because everybody's got a vision. Yes. There's a bucket list of lovers and what they have to bring, the expectations. Yes. And I think the world potentially maybe over the last 20 years that you've been a, uh, a therapist, Catherine, um, has become a little bit more complicated. But here, vision is one part of the equation. I think the common vision is what then is where you can start building the relationship because you said relationships don't happen. Relationships yes. don't happen. Relationships don't happen. They are built right. day by day. Vision, common vision. Um, and that, yes. I think, is where all of us, basically, at yes. some point, have failed because <clears throat> he's got his vision. Yes. And I've got my vision. And we kind of live happily ever after. And then all of a sudden we go like, and who are you? Because we kind of right. managed to communicate, listen, and put it on the same kind of pedestal. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and if you think of sometimes it's couples often do well if they have a common project, like raising kids together, or they have a company together, whatever. But actually, whether or not that you have those things, you always have a common vision. Because it turns out that our relationships are so important to how we feel in the world, that you always have the common vision of needing and wanting that relationship to be as good as it can possibly be. And it's very important that couples realize that they are always in this boat together. They're always together trying to collaborate. Every conversation has some differences in it. Often our hard conversations are about things that we're not the same about. But what we always have in common is we need that conversation to go well and we need the relationship to go well. Lots of research tells us that the most important aspect of our well-being is our important relationships. And we don't even have to look to the, to the research to know that. I mean, I know for sure on a day when my husband and I had an argument as we were going out the door, no matter how good that day goes, Beyond that, nothing seems quite right. It's a, going to be a hard day until we get it back together. And conversely, if I'm having a really good day with my husband, even if many other things go wrong, I kind of feel up to it. You know, I can kind of meet that. And so when you think about what really makes a difference in how you feel, if, you ha if you're in a primary relationship, husband, kids, whatever, those things need to be kind of on track. And so it's really important to remember that as you encounter the differences in a conversation, even the simple ones about what are you going to have for dinner, that, yeah, you're going to, you're going to talk about the differences, but you're collaborating to have that talk go well. Yeah. And this collaboration uh, mindset. It, we are in this together. We are always to, you know, looking at each other rather than turning away, have yeah. more can-do attitude. <clears throat> I think that is also something that um, Jenny and uh, John Gottman talk about uh, yeah. in their relationship theory, which, yeah. which you know is very very true. But uh, you know, then then let's go to it. What makes what would you say are the main elements also taken from your work? You know, work the case studies, the relationship you've been analyzing and helping. What makes a good relationship? What makes a good relationship? <clears throat> So I would start, I'm going to start with a couple of things just about what I think that is. And then I want to mention three things that I think really have to do with, well, how do you get there? Um, a relationship, first of all, you put the relationship first, as we were just talking about. What makes a good relationship is that you prioritize it. Let me put an aside in there because sometimes we go down the wrong road when we think, well, that means being selfless. That means I put myself aside. Not at all. It doesn't mean that you come second. It doesn't mean that you come first. It means that you understand that one of the ways you take care of yourself is to take care of the relationship. And conversely, part of how you take care of the relationship is to make sure that your needs are being met and that you work together so that you're collaborating so that we're both thinking about how do we get our needs met and we're both working on all of that, which is different than the adversarial stance that some people assume of I have to defend what I need and you have to defend what you need, which puts us in an adversarial relationship with each other. But in a true collaboration that's about relationship number one, we're both trying to solve for what do we each need. So that's the first thing. Can I just yeah. right there? Because yeah. there for me, your aperture already comes in, Catherine. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, because I'm so in love. I'm showered with my dopamine, and I just want to make this common vision work. Yes. So telling him exactly, <clears throat> honestly, what my needs are, yes. I'm really too scared because I'm risking. I'm risking, and he says, uh, mm, maybe not. And then my dopamine kick walks out of the door. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, yes. Where cause, part of a good relationship is that you figure out how to support risk taking. So it's you, yes, you have to make risks and take risks. But part of how you do that is you have a collaboration where you understand the value of that. So that if someone takes a risk that goes badly, perhaps they risk saying the wrong thing and it's the wrong moment, you're in a terrible grouchy mood. You try to make it so that that lands softly so that the person that took the risk doesn't feel stupid, foolish, or like, gee, I'll never take a risk with you again. You try to support and protect risk taking, knowing that how valuable it is to your relationship. That gets back to the how. The other thing I would say about a good relationship, which is just a repeat of what I said before, is it's all about learning. In a good relationship, both people understand that they're helping each other to learn. I often call this the, the learning partners of relationship, that there are certain ways you support learning like what we just talked about with risk-taking. Part of how you support learning is that you support risk-taking. And part of how you do that is that you make sure that nobody takes too big of a fall if they take the wrong risk at the wrong time. Yeah. Um, in terms of how, how you get to a good relationship, um, I want to go back to aperture awareness because it's, it's kind of so obvious that it can, it can go right by us. Mindfulness has become something that most people know about <clears throat> for the few, few people that may not have encountered it quite yet. Mindfulness means paying attention in the moment. And what I'm saying about aperture and openness is that the most important thing to pay attention to, if you can't pay attention to anything else, is the openness in the moment. And how you build a good relationship is to understand that in each, each moment, I may or may not be open to you. You may or may not be open to me. We're, we're working with that. So, for example, it goes like this. Um, you tell me that you want to go to see your mother on our next vacation, Right. Yay. I, don't, I don't really want to go see your mother on a vacation. I would understand that. <laughs> so I closed down a little bit. And so you, sensing that I'm closing, instinctually, you may speak a little bit louder. So you start to talk a little bit louder, and I start to close down. And you start to talk faster, and I start to close down more. And then you start to insist and repeat yourself, and now I'm completely closed. Oh, by the way, you are too. So now you've got two people completely closed trying to converse with each other. Here's where the importance of aperture awareness comes in. It's not a good idea to try to talk to each other when you're closed. Not only will you not be heard or understood or find collaboration, you're going to injure each other. Those are the moments where you say the wrong thing, you hear things the wrong way. You don't want to be in contact with each other meaningfully when you're closed. But suppose instead I hear, let's go see my mother on the next vacation. I close down a little bit you start to talk a little faster. I start to close down a little bit more, but I notice, wait a second, something doesn't feel right. I think I'm closing down. So aperture awareness starts with my own aperture. How open am I right now? And I say, I'm having trouble. You know, this person is talking loud and fast and I'm closing down fast. So instead of just letting it go with that, instead of not noticing or not doing anything, I call timeout and I say, hold on a second. I do really want to talk to you about this. I hear that this is really important to you. And of course, the vacation is really important to both of us. We do need to have a great conversation about this. I'm having trouble being open. It's a hard topic for me talking about going to see your mother. And you're talking too loudly and too fast. And I can't keep up. I'm just like closing down. I think that I can listen better if you could talk a little more softly and if we can go a little more slowly. I, and I think the other, person, the other person feels motivated to do that because what you've emphasized is I'm going to try to take care of this conversation. I'm going to try, try to make sure I hear you. I want to hear what you have to say. And so they're motivated. OK, let me see if I can work with that. So the key here is using your awareness of your aperture and the other person's aperture to make some kind of adjustment so that you can both reopen so that all the things that you're trying to get in that moment can happen.
Yeah. Uh, and, and the concepts in there, and please correct me if I'm wrong there, which I'm reading is that we, when we are in an emotional conversation, like uh, my mother is emotional to me. So I say, <clears throat> I see my mom during the vacation. Of right. course, vacation is not in a vacuum. It is uh, potentially with right. the family. So it affects you. Right. Um, you are, this is an emotional thing. So all of a sudden we stop yeah. thinking rationally about it as a first gut reaction because something has been triggered and I've just talked to Dr. Susan Campbell about her book uh, from trigger to tranquil where any word that you Catherine say says say say to me may trigger some emotional reaction so the limbic and the uh, brain is is being touched or even the amygdala and we go like louder faster more animal-like rather than sapiens yes her work, by the way, is very related to this. You're right. Because what triggers are, what triggers means is that something has caused our aperture to close rather dramatically all of a sudden. So this is our limbic brain going into fight, fright, fli- freeze. Right. Yes. Right. And, and, and that's the same thing as closed aperture. So aperture basically is when the prefrontal cortex shuts down, we stop thinking, we yes. start acting in a very basic way with yes. each other, which may even be a very evolved, mature, beautiful, stable relationship, but it happens to everybody. So yes. that is kind of like a conflict management tool that, yes. that you also have. And when you say time out is yes. literally the physical Get, trying to um, base the, the physical uh, arousedness or emotionality, breathe out, come yes. back and come yes. towards each other. And I think that is very beautiful because I think also that touches on the conflict style. We all have a different conflict style. Yes. Um, and that is something I think is very much impacted by the way we were raised and we watched our parents in conflict. Yes. And that was yeah. the very first thing that you said that actually triggered you to get more or less into this career, which I yeah. think as a child, you know, I was looking at my parents uh, fighting like cats and dogs and me yeah. asking them when I was, I remember when I was 13, 14, please get divorced. It's okay with me. I will not be damaged. I'm already, but I will not be damaged. But just please, I can understand you guys not getting on. They've been right. 50 years. I'm like, oh, oh, all right, whatever. But this conflict the way they were with each other, I had to fight that to not mm-hmm. have that as part of my conflicts management yes. style in my yes. relationships. Yes, yes. Yeah, the key here is to know. So um, this is great because you're, you're actually talking about, for all of us, all those different things that are on the roadmap. So conflict styles on the roadmap. What I do try to tell people is, yes, you need to know. It will help you to know in advance, like certain things trigger me, certain things like too much um, loud talking, too much yelling, too much intensity. That's going to trigger me. But also knowing what your aperture is, is not something that you get to by thinking about it. It's something, it's, it's a felt sensation. Our brains are wired to, to let us know that. It's sort of like vision. When I'm looking at something, I don't know that I'm seeing it because, my, because I'm analyzing, gee, how many photons are hitting the retina at what angle, at what speed? You know, it's not about that. I open my eyes and I see something. Aperture awareness, the ability to sense your own openness is like that. You open your eyes, meaning you open your awareness of your aperture and you understand, oh yeah, I'm very closed down right now. For some people, that's very physical. So if if you're having trouble thinking, well, how how do I know if I'm open? For some people, um, hardness in the body, coldness in the body, tension in the jaw, in the stomach, that's all, that's closed. Open is that nice, soft, relaxed feeling. Um, I'm having a good time here. I, I like our conversation. That's open. So what I point people to is, yes, it's important to know what kinds of things you need to kind of work with or more likely to be hard for you. But more importantly, pay attention in the moment. If you just got triggered and you're closing down, then that's a moment to adjust something. And the example I gave before is adjusting something on the outside, like asking your your conversational partner to slow down. 
But also there are these adjustments on the inside. So that comes to maybe you need a, maybe you need a pause and just a moment to collect yourself. In fact, maybe you need that moment to pull over to the side of the road and look at the road map. You know that you're triggered. You know that, wow, I'm closed tight as a drum right now. So you say, hold on a second. Give me a few seconds. And then you go inside and you think, wow, what's going on? Mm, that's, there's that loud voice again. I know that loud voices, uh, it's a non-starter for me. What can I do about that? I could ask them to talk more softly, yes. But also I could just sit here and breathe for a couple of seconds and let my system regulate and let myself slow down. Slowing down, I wanna go back to that in there because slowing down is, is the best, best tool in the toolbox. But you slow down for a few minutes and you let yourself kind of ease back down and then you restart. And then at that point, you might say, OK, I'm good to go again. And remember that thing I told you about getting triggered by loud voices? Mm -hmm. Let's just let's just chill a little bit here. Say the same things you're saying, but could you say them a little more softly? Because I think that's the way I can hear you. No, I, I, you, can, you can feel in that how your partner then, again, you're signaling, I really am trying to hear you work with me here. Yeah. And discover, discover, listen. And we'll talk about yeah. listening in a, in a moment. But what I think is very interesting, you know, this this entire um, slowing down, a lot of people don't know how to slow <clears> down. And uh, and they always laugh when people say, just breathe, breathe out, you know, calm the vagus nerve. And they are fantastic techniques. And actually, they do work, uh, yes. you know, to, to get back into the senses. And what I think is such a juxtaposition, whilst you have to be in the moment, mm -hmm really to to manage your relationship and build your relationship you know adding yeah. pearls to that beautiful necklace which yeah. they will be yeah. that years of marriage you must not be caught up in the moment you yeah. must be in the moment but not caught up and kind of like in yeah. the moment caught up uh, and you lose the entire vision of the beauty if you step back and you say hey after all we do have a great relationship we do have the same vision yeah. there's a little tiffle let's not you know let's just calm down but moving on from that is if we know now what you're saying, what, what makes a good relationship, what are the main <clears throat> issues, what are the common denominators you have seen, Catherine, over the last 20 years that can really break a relationship, why people come to you? That's my first question. And to what extent it has actually changed potentially from, let's say, 20 years ago to now that we are bombarded with social media, that we our attention is everywhere at the same time, what well, it's not supposed to be. Tell me a little bit about the main issues you see couples really facing and struggling with. Yes. Um, so life is going to bombard us with all kinds of issues. You know, the key content issues in almost all important relationships, couples in particular, are sex, money, kids, and time. You know, and so, yeah, those things, couples are going to have to work out and there are going to be differences. What breaks the relationship, however, is failing to learn how to deal with differences and conflict in ways that don't break the relationship. In other words, there are always going to be differences. There are always going to be hard conversations. There are some differences. John Gottman points out that most of our hard conversations happen about the same topics over and over again. He calls these perpetual issues. And I think he says that about two thirds of hard conversations involve the per per perpetual issues. That's really important. It's an important thing to learn in and of itself, because I think we think in terms of, oh, we need to resolve this. We need to get rid of this problematic area. That's not realistic. That's not what's going to happen. What can happen is that you learn better and better how to have conversations about that conflict area, that difference in ways that <clears throat> support your relationship, support your collaboration, as opposed to damaging it. What brings people to see me, and one way to des describe that, is that through a failure to learn how to deal with differences, you start to get into a downward spiral. You start to fail. You're, you're having conversations that are hurting you instead of helping you. You're coming away from conversations feeling discouraged, unloved, not collaborated with. You're becoming adversaries instead of allies. And that's a downward spiral. And the, the characteristic of the downward spiral is you feel like you're adversaries. You're constantly having adversarial encounters where you're kind of debating and going up against each other. You're noticing that 
often when you say something, your partner misunderstands it in a negative direction exactly. or your partner says something and you instantly think the worst of it. Benefit of the doubt is long gone. Um, and, uh, and basically it's not any fun anymore. The other thing that Gottman says is that um, he's very fond of two thirds, two thirds of the time, your interaction should be positive. Yes, yes, absolutely. Total interaction should be positive two thirds of the time. That's a lot. And it tells you something about the importance of context and the importance of it's not all about solving the problems. So when you get to a point that it's not mostly positive, it's mostly not fun anymore, your enemies, you're constantly coming away from encounters feeling worse instead of better, you know that you're in a downward spiral. And the important thing to know about that is it's going to it's going to be very hard to reverse the spiral. It's going to involve learning a lot because the way you got there was you didn't learn for your couple. You didn't learn how your collaboration needs to go. And that's not an easy thing to learn. And most couples come into coupleship thinking they're just supposed to either automatically know it or by the end of the first day, they got it down. This is a lifetime of learning. And so if you don't learn, don't start to learn, you're going to start to go downward. And now it's going to be hard to reverse that. The important thing about knowing that is that it's not always going to be as hard as it is at the point of the down, downward spiral. Um, it's going to take Sometimes I tell my couples, it's going to take 80% of your effort to get the first 2% of a shift. And, what's, and that's not fair because you're starting from a place of discouragement, despair, feeling like, I don't know if this is going to work. Yeah, it's not, okay. it's it's not, not fair that we would have to work that hard right away, right? Exactly. It should, we should be getting rewards. It's important to know because otherwise you're going to mistake um, success for failure. When your partner makes that 2% change where they remember to say, thanks for a nice meal, but they didn't remember to say the other five things that you wanted to hear that day. You're going to, you could walk away saying, yeah, I knew it. We're never going to get there. This is hopeless. But if you know that that first 2% of the change is like a little, it's like a little shoot coming out of the ground, this little tiny green thing, then you know not to step on it. You know that, yes, it's small, but this is the thing that comes you, tells you that spring is coming. This is the thing that tells you a plant can grow as long as you treat this properly and gently and nourish it. And that's so important because otherwise we make big mistakes about thinking that we're failing when we're actually succeeding. So that's the important thing to know. The other important thing to know about a downward spiral is that don't be too proud to get a coach, which means a downward spiral. Why would you want to make, why would you want to do this the hard way? You've already discovered that you're not learning enough well together as a couple get a coach. Coach means therapist. It means somebody that knows a little bit more about how to guide relationships in general than you do yet about your own couple. They know just like a, if you, if you want to learn to play the piano, you could probably teach yourself, but you might learn faster and have more fun sooner if you got a teacher. So find yourself a teacher, somebody that knows about relationships and get a leg up on it so that the first part of it isn't quite so hard. No, I think this is absolutely fundamental. And this adversary and ally, I always call it, are we in the same bubble or are we not? And yes. uh, sometimes one of the partners steps out of the bubble and sees everything you say as something yes. against them. And uh, it's really kind of a shift in mindset. And this downward vertex, yes. vortex is really sucking you further and further because you have to switch perspective. Yes. And the circuit breaker is A, so hard to find. And sometimes B also depends whether or whether not you'll find it, how deep down for how yes. long you have gone yes. and the trust has broken. And that's my next question to you, Catherine. You know, for example, <clears throat> infidelity, you were talking about, you know, uh, the typical issues are sex, money, family, and, and what have you, just in allocating right. your precious time, not to your partner, yes. but to your yeah. friends or whatever you do. So um, let's take sex, for example. And yeah. sex is, is something that, um, again, you, you mentioned the media, is portrayed in a certain way and as a substantial part of a good relationship or it yeah. needs to look, feel, sound like that because whatever yeah. is on television is validated as this is the right way to do it um, yeah. with, certain, you know, with certain caveats. So I wonder, 
where does you know the, the physical attraction really reflect what is actually happening on a very different level within the couple? Does it start with there is distancing physically, which then is followed by feeling really also distant emotionally or psychologically from the partner? Or is it the other way around that somehow you started not moving in the same direction? You know, at limit, you are parallel or you are, you know, but you do not find that common ground, which then can be shared in a physical sense. Right. Hang on. Um, I would say it it can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, As many people know, um, you can have a lot of sexual energy for somebody with whom you don't necessarily have a great relationship. Mm -hmm. And in fact, sometimes people find their way into a relationship that's really hard to make into a relationship because the sexual energy is so positive and so good, right? And you can also have a really great relationship with someone with whom your sexual energy isn't quite there. It can happen in a lot of different ways. What I would say is sex is a very important area of relationship for most people. And it's a very complicated area. Part of what makes working out the sexual part of relationships so difficult is that it's maybe our place of maximum vulnerability. Being sexual with somebody involves um, a nakedness, not just of our bodies, but of our feelings. It involves a certain being willing to feel emotions spontaneously as they come up, as opposed to, wait a minute, I have to go collect myself. Um, it's and so letting go, uh, yeah. no matter how one looks, sounds, how ridiculous, or whatever, but it's just that. Yes. So, so it's a very important area to work out, but there's no one rule of thumb that you could follow and say, well, if we just get our emotional relationship together, the sex will follow. Getting the emotional relationship together will help everything get better. And it will help you, for instance, talking about sex is a very important thing to do. It's hard to talk about sex with somebody that you're in a downward spiral with, with somebody that you're not in the same bubble with. So getting your emotional thing back together, feeling that you're allies again instead of adversaries will definitely help you deal with this tricky area of now let's look at what's happening with us sexually because that does matter. Um, Also, having good sex can also make you feel better emotionally and can make it easier to have that hard conversation the next day. And many couples follow that. There's a little bit of a gender bias here and it goes like this. Often it's true, some people need to be sexually connected, physically connected, erotically connected in order to feel emotionally connected. And for some people, it's kind of the flip. They need to feel emotionally connected in order to feel open to sex. Generally speaking, more of the people who need to feel physically connected to feel emotionally connected are men. Mm-hmm. And more of the people that feel the other way are women, but it doesn't strictly divide along gender lines. But there are those two differences. So sometimes people ask me, so then what do we do? Do, do we have sex first or we to get connected emotionally? And I would say it's a little bit like hopping from lily pad to lily pad. You know, try to get as close as you can physically, given what's going on emotionally. That might mean that you start holding hands again if you've been completely distant. Um, maybe holding hands again makes you feel a little bit more comfortable to have that hard conversation. Maybe having the hard conversation well makes you a little bit more comfortable to cuddle up that night as opposed to just going to sleep separately. And you kind of you kind of try to leapfrog back toward the place where both things are working pretty well. And yeah, ideally, um, the, a delicious sexual encounter includes feeling very open emotionally as well as very open physically. Yes, and I think it opens the aperture as well. And to I like your 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 analogy with hopping from Lily to Lily. And I was thinking um, when I heard that, I was thinking about Gottman when he talked about you know what needs to happen is you guys need to have fun. And I'm not talking about fun going, being silly, whatever. But the right. entire milieu of of your your family or your um, you as a couple yes. need to have that you know, um, skip in this, uh, in, in this step, that lightness, that brightness, that, uh, you know, that looking at each other and, and, and still being like, hey, you know, um, what's going on? And um, right. trying to be curious, trying to yeah. find out, you called it learning. And I think it's really, really important to not just ask, hey, how are you? Because, you know, you, this is kind of what you do, but you're genuinely still interested. And I think that is already creating yeah. a, a, um, an atmosphere 
where a touch is so much easier. And when the touch is there, you know, hormone, from, from, from a hormone point of view, you've got the oxytocin flowing, you've got yes. the serotonin flowing. So then really physically something is happening, which then is the, you know, mental aperture being then transferred to a physical aperture as well. Yes. I mean, yes. I, I guess you can translate one with the other. Now, again, um, moving on from that, we are living in a very different society now from a demographic point of view. I mean, Catherine, these days we live a long life. A lot of us have potentially also the environment where we can have two or three meaningful relationships. Yes. How do we deal with it? I mean, this I don't want to say a consumerist possibility, also because of metrocom and whatever, but to what extent do you really need to close and move on? Is there the point where you know, something is broken, trust is broken, infidelity happened, and that's it. It's not recuperable anymore. And is that something that a therapist needs to say, yeah, guys, don't worry about it anymore. You just need to move <laughs> on, you know? And is that so bad these days? Because culturally speaking, maybe still in the 50s, 60s is not what you necessarily did. You had your affairs, but you stayed married. Religiously yeah. right. or whatever, just because society asked you to, because right. not the Joneses will talk. And nowadays it's like, you know, you don't entertain me anymore. I'm financially independent. And you know what? I think I may move on. Where, right. where are we? Right. Well, we're all those places. Um, mm -hmm. As you're pointing out, all of those things are still happening. People do still stay together because staying together is the primary value for them. And they find a way to stay together, which may not be making the kind of relationship that somebody else might want. It may mean prioritizing staying together. Everything to the other extreme with people that don't necessarily want one committed relationship. They may want several, either sequentially or simultaneously, really great relationships. The key here is staying true to what you feel is a really great relationship. And this could be different at different points in time. Sometimes you're in a phase um, where you don't necessarily want a lifetime commitment. You don't necessarily want a monogamous commitment, but you do want the quality of your relationships to be caring, collaborative, connected. You want to get that kind of Mm, juicy sense of being understood and cared about from the people that you're with, <clears throat> which emphasizes that we don't just get that from our, um, from our marriage partner. We also get that from our friendships. We get some of that from our collaborators and work relationships. And so the key is to make sure that this relationship is healthy and nurturing to both of you. And what I would say is how do you know when it's not, how do you know when you need to call it off? Often people give up too early because they don't really understand this thing about learning. So stay true to your vision. Stay with the idea of I deserve and want to be in a meaningful relationship that nurtures me and that I feel that my nurturing of the other person is taken in. Stay with your big vision. And then look to see, are we failing to meet that vision because we really have learned a lot and we, it's still not there for whatever reason. <clears throat> One reason can be is that something got broken that can't be repaired. Mm -hmm. For some people that might be an affair. Sometimes an affair breaks a relationship irretrievably and other times it doesn't. So you have to be wise about, is that true for you? And there may be other things, less um, dramatic hurts that have happened that simply signal you, no, no, I'm not, I'm not there anymore. What I caution people against is make sure that you took the time to find out if this was a failure of learning. Are there things that you haven't figured out yet that could make you into the couple that's capable of moving toward this vision? And if you determine that you can't, then gracefully move on so that both so that each of you has a chance at that vision of a relationship. Yes, and it is so interesting because it makes me think about rather than it seems a lot of people rather than going in with, OK, what's the vision? What can I learn in order right. to, you know, understand my partner, understand their dynamics and contribute as such to a good relationship without self-sacrifice right. or, you know, you don't have to kind of cancel yourself out by, you know, getting closer but I think most people still think, especially in the love phase, ah, you know, he'll change. She'll change. And there's still <clears> that mission that, yes, vision, fantastic. 
but they're going to change. And, and, and it seems to be like a mission of, okay, I'm going to get that person to what I actually want and or I measure right. along right. with the vision. So how do you, how do you reconcile, reconcile that? Well, that's another one of those, I think, lifelong learning things about ourselves and other people are what are the things that can change and how can they change? How do we learn things, various kinds of important things? And what are the things that we can live with? And we don't know that in the beginning. Some things may be very irritating that 10 years later, we decide, you know, that's actually not even that important. And other things may turn out to be more important than we thought. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a matter of figuring out. And uh, yes, people, do, people, people, probably the burning question right after how do I get you to be open to me is do people really change? And that might be the single question the couples therapists are asked the most. And they usually ask it the first session, you know, because the, people are coming in with a certain amount of discouragement. I don't encourage people to to take the point of view of, well, you just have to accept each other exactly as you are. I had a friend once who was in a not so great relationship. And she said to me one day, she said, I've tried so hard to just accept him exactly as he is. And I said, well, why did you think that would be enough? Meaning we're not meant to come together with total acceptance of everything we are, because that implies something very static about human beings. Like I am who I am. And 10 years from now, I'm still going to be exactly this way. That's not what a human being is. A human being is constantly evolving, constantly learning, constantly figuring out new and better ways to do everything, but including and especially to connect with other people. So we need to hold a combination. Um, It's sort of like in yoga, which is one of the major places that I've learned things. In yoga, there's a concept of working at your edge. And what working at your edge means is that in each pose, you're trying to be in total acceptance of where am I today? What's possible for me and my body today? And also, where can I move just a little bit further? Where's the possibility for movement, flexibility, increased strength, same thing in a relationship. At any moment, you're trying to figure out how do we work at our edge? How do we help each other to learn? And that's what I mean by learning partners. Partially it's your job to accept each other and partially it's your job job to figure out not just how to tell your partner what you want, but how do you facilitate them learning that? And there's a real art to that. And too often we just kind of hand it off to the other person and say, here, go fix yourself. Well, it doesn't work that way. If, if it's something important, then it's going to require a collaboration to figure out, well, you're constantly getting impatient with me. How do we work together so that your ability to be patient with me starts to grow? Yeah. And the link that's the right question. That's the right question. And the link with yoga, how you push yourself to the edge every single time to that edge possible on that day, actually yes. again, has to do with breathing. Because yes. when you breathe out, you know, you can yes. make that split just a little bit less, you know, a little bit lower. Right. The same right. thing, interestingly, with the dynamics. And I think about aperture, what, what I understood from your work is that aperture, inducing the aperture in the other person actually starts with offering it. You know, yeah. being open yourself and being the first one to say, hey, let's not do a win-lose. Let's not do a right or wrong. Let's right. do a where do we go? And learning is so fundamental. I always call it discovering just to make it a little bit more palatable to me. You know, I'm learning all day, every day. I'm like, okay, I don't want to learn anymore. I just want to discover and have an adventure. Right. And I, I try to approach it that way. And that brings me to something really important. And that was one of the articles I pulled down from your fantastic blog on psychology today. Listen like you mean it. Now, Catherine, tell us. <clears throat> right way to listen what's the key to really listen so start with remembering that what you're really trying for is a collaborative dialogue too often we're in drag and drop mode first of all we're we're moving we're talking well yeah actually (laughs) first you slow down because our conversations happen at a rate that we can't even process the content, much less stay in touch with how we're feeling, 
um, how open or not we are to the ideas that we're hearing. So it starts with knowing that a really great conversation where you're really going to be able to listen is going to be, you're going to talk more slowly. There's going to be spaces for both of you to kind of hear from the other person what's really happening. So you slow it down and you remember we're in a collaborative dialogue. Most conversations and most of the ways we think about conversation is I'm going to tell you what I know and or think, feel, want, and you're going to tell me what you know, think, feel, or want. Drag and drop. Drag and drop is not the point. A really good conversation starts with what we both bring to the conversation, like here's what I know about what I think about that. Now tell me what you think about that. But then that's just the beginning. What we're looking for is a conversation where we're talking well enough together that we're discovering new things. So the key to listening is knowing when you say something, I'm not listening to refute it. I'm not listening to decide, do I agree or disagree? As soon as you're asking yourself, do I agree or disagree? You know that you just slipped off the bus. You know, you need to get back on to the point of, wait a second, beyond do I agree or disagree? How could the two of us make use of that idea that you just floated? And it becomes our idea to play with, not something that you have to defend and I have to come up with something better than. And so true listening is that mode. It's like you're, I'm really trying to hear everything I can that's valuable in what you're saying, including things that I didn't know before or something, you might say something, yeah, I've heard that before. Well, wait a second, listen again then. Yeah. Is she really saying something I've heard before? Or maybe she has a slightly different take on it. Maybe I need to ask a question to find out, does she have a slightly different take on that? So I might say, well, Patricia, what does, you know, that thing about wholeness, what does that really mean to you? Because people mean different things by wholeness. And so we realize that a conversation is something we're building together. And we get excited about that project of how far can we go together? That's the basis of true listening. And yes, it involves questions. Yes, it involves the patience of listening, because listening is maybe one of the hardest things we do. Um, but true listening involves this thing of listening in order to learn, in order to expand together. Exactly. Involve the relationship. That's that's yes. the thing. And it all is, I always think it's always cocooned in genuinely wanting this to be a good relationship and trusting yes. that both are on the same page on that. Yes. Because yes. the listening is, I want to listen if I know that, you know, what you're saying is pro me, pro yes. relationship and vice versa. And unless that basis of trust is that we want to advance as a couple yeah. uh, is there, then, you know, there's no listening there. And then I, I think that is really, really fundamental. And for me, it would actually be definitely one of those boxes that I'd say, um, I choose my partner, dopamine kick or not, adrenaline, uh, norepinephrine, I don't care what's right. floating through my body. But is that a mindset of growth? Yes. I, I need that from, uh, you know, my personal relationship, from my friend relationships, right. from it's just a personal culture by which I pick people I mix with. And that goes down to intimate partners, unless yeah. it's the same desire of evolving, making things better every single day, that little pearl, sometimes it's a yes. pebble, but still it adds yeah. to it. I don't know. Um, it would be certainly a criteria that if that's not part of the, the character, however sexy or what have you, would not make it. Yeah, I think that you just nailed the most important thing. People often make the mistake of, thinking that they have to be well, they say, well, we're just not well matched. And what they mean by it is uh, that is like, you love golf and I hate golf. Never mind about golf. It's not what's going to matter. What, when they say what needs to be, what, what do we, how do we need to be well matched? You need to be well matched in terms of your interest in learning. Couples that, that don't really work is where one couple is very interested in learning and the other person not so much. So when they say, what should I look for in a partner? Look for somebody that has the same interest in learning you do. And oh, by the way, if you're not so interested in learning, you might want to consider getting more interested in learning because that's what's going to make your relationship grow. Exactly. And your own life enriched. I mean, and your I, whole life. And your yeah, whole we, life. Are, we are. I mean, people always say, you know, because we are human, things happen. I just think, 
because we are human, we can influence things to happen. Yes, exactly, exactly. And uh, it's not all about the cards you're dealt. It's also about how you learn to work with them and how you learn to work with yourself. You know, the big learning project of life is figuring out how, how do we work? You know, what are my best conditions for listening and patience and feeling loving? And that's a, that's a long project to figure out how do I work with myself? Um, So that it starts with that. Yeah. Okay. Then we have to, unfortunately I could talk for hours with you, Catherine, I'll call you back on some personal issues (laughs) perhaps as well. (laughs) No, but uh, to sum up our wonderful conversation today, um, what would you say um, are the three, maybe five key things you would tell anybody as an individual being or entering a relationship and also in a couple situation? What do you think are the, 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 the three to five key pillars we always have to somehow keep in our minds and our right. body to have some sort of, you know, something to hang on to that gives us you know, just that that motivation to continue to listen, to put the effort in. What what do you say? Right from the beginning, beginning, pay attention to your own openness. Does this person tend to inspire you to be open? What do you, often we say, oh, I just love being with them. Part of that is I feel nice and open. I feel nice and relaxed. So pay attention from the beginning. Is this somebody that opens your aperture, that makes it easy for you to be open and available? That's number one. Number two, is this somebody with whom you can have a grand vision of relationship? Because you're going to need that amount of inspiration to do the hard work. Number three is Um, Make sure that you understand that building a relationship happens moment by moment. It's it's never over. In each given moment, you can make things better. And that has to do with cultivating a certain kind of awareness in the moment of what's really happening here, what needs to happen. So pay attention in the moment, build your relationship, learn as you go. And remember that the biggest learning project is learning about yourself and learning those things that we learn over a lifetime that have to do with listening well, being patient, being a more loving person, being a more generous person. And and offer that to someone with a spirit of collaboration and and being allies and being as Patricia says in the same bubble as opposed to being adversarial and watch out for moments that you feel adversarial and do something about that love it absolutely love it fantastic Catherine thank you so much for being with us here on Mentor TV I think your work is magnificent I know you are working on a book so have me under your top 10 uh, contacts please to um, read that book um, help you to to uh, promote it speak about it openly and uh, yes thank you for joining us from the Pacific Coast which island are you on tell us this is fantastic Um, I am currently in Washington State on Orcas Island, um, about about to relocate uh, to to California and Rhode Island. Um, I kind of move around these days, as a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, but if people want to find me, <clears throat> they can go to my website, which is CatherineFordMD.com, and you'll find everything else there, including the courses I teach at Stanford. No, absolutely. And also your blog on um, Psychology Today. That's, that's right, awesome. right, exactly. Right. It's all the contacts, how to get uh, in contact with you, more about you. Your website is very, very, um, very elaborate. You, you really get something out of it. And I think that that contact is fabulous. Catherine, right. thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's a pleasure talking to you about these things. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, dear Mentory TV community. It's about time we talked about relationships. I know we're talking about blockchain and narcissism and politics, what have you. But at the end of the day, we are all beautiful human beings that need connection, relationships, and they shape our everyday life. So we want to make sure that we have good ones all around it. So I hope you liked our conversation with Dr. Catherine Ford. If you did, thumbs up. And I hope to see you soon here back on Mentory TV. Stay safe and stay curious. Bye.